After you finish debugging your project, it's time to make your Arduino permanent. Now you could go buy something like this cheap nano form factor, or you can build your own custom board. Here's an example of my RetroPie power controller. It has a custom Arduino built in. In this episode of Atoms, I'm going to show you how to build a DIY Arduino board, the key things you need, and the stuff you should not miss. This video is part one of a three-part series. In the future parts, I'll design the PCB, and then another one, I'll turn on the assembled board. Stay tuned and subscribe for when those episodes are available. Just a quick note, I'm going to be using KiCad in this video. <laughs> wow, I did not expect the comments to explode so quickly. Look, I could use Eagle or Altium or Diptrace or even a pen and some paper. That's not the point of this video. So regardless of what CAD tools you use, this tutorial is focused on the design, not the tools. Okay, now that's out of the way, let's go design something. First up, we need a heart or, well, brain. So I'm going to grab the ATmega 328P. There are a lot of pins here, but by the time we're done, most of these will be connected somewhere. Next, we need something to drive that chip, which means we're gonna be connecting a clock signal. You see, everything that happens inside of a microcontroller is based on this clock signal, which gets generated from an oscillator circuit. Processors like the 328 do have a built-in oscillator, but it could be considered slow and it's not what I call accurate. External clocks can run at almost any speed you want and have much higher accuracy. Okay, so then what is an oscillator? When something oscillates, it moves back and forth. A waveform going from low to high is like an oscillating signal. For a microcontroller, this signal gets called the clock. Here are three ways to create a clock signal for an Arduino. An RC circuit, a ceramic resonator, or a quartz crystal. RC resonators are not all that accurate and they change quite a bit with temperature and voltage. If you need UART or serial communication, this oscillator type just doesn't work. Ceramic resonators are slightly better, but they're still not the best option. With that said, genuine Arduino boards do tend to use ceramic resonators, at least on the 328. Unless board space is limit or cost is a huge concern, I prefer using a crystal. They do require a couple of load capacitors to form the oscillator circuit. Diving into how that works is cool, but more detailed than I want to do for this video. So for now, let's just go look at the 328's datasheet and see what they recommend. Here we see the recommended values are between 2 and 22 picofarads. Since I already have 22 picofarad caps, I'm gonna add those into the design. You might notice I called out C0G ceramic capacitors. These are ultra stable with voltage, temperature, and time, but that's gonna come in a different video. Speaking of capacitors, we need to add some decoupling capacitors, you know, the famous ones, to the IC. Each of the VCC pens will get its own 100 nanofarad capacitor. Real quick, the idea of a decoupling capacitor is that you want to decouple the IC's power pins from the rest of the circuit or the supply. Picking the correct value for a decoupling capacitor is a complicated topic. Smaller loads like a simple IC usually need something like 100 nanofarads up to 1000 nanofarads or one microfarad, while larger loads might require hundreds of microfarads. For now, let's keep all the IC's decoupling capacitors in a group to keep the schematic clean. When I get to the PCB design, I'll need to remember to spread these back out. While my code has never had issues, I have heard about others needing to reset their microcontrollers. And so let's look at how we add a button to reset. No labels connect the signals together. This is easier than drawing lines all over the schematic. This push button provides the connection to ground, which allows me to force the processor into reset. You might be thinking I forgot to add a pull-up resistor, but the thing is this chip already has one. Now, I am going to add a pull-up resistor, but not for the reason you might think. The reason is for auto reset. You see, to use the Arduino bootloader to program over USB or serial, we need to add a few more parts. First, a 100 nanofarad capacitor is connected between the serial signal DTR and the 328's reset pin. And then here is that pull-up resistor. The way this little circuit works is that when DTR is held high, both sides of the capacitor are high, keeping reset, well, high. When the port opens, DTR goes low, discharging the capacitor to zero volts. That brief drop resets the 328. 
Eventually, the capacitor recharges through the pull-up resistor, bringing the processor out of reset and letting it boot. This diode just makes sure that there's no spikes above VCC. Adding auto reset does have one downside. Anytime the computer accesses the serial port, the processor will be reset. So you need to decide, is that going to be an issue for your design? If it is, then skip it and just use the push button to manually reset whenever you want to upload code. If your board is going to be powered by USB, then add a USB socket, a polyfuse, and a 10 microfarad capacitor. Now keep that capacitance small because if you have too much, it will violate the USB inrush current spec. For my design, I'm going to pretend we're not using USB power. Instead, we're going to use something like a brick or wall wart. By the way, that's spelled W-A-R-T and not W-O-R-T. For the regulator, I'm going to use a NCP1117. And on the input, I'll put 10 microfarads and on the output, one microfarad. Now, you might be asking, how did I arrive at these values? Well, the short story is, I'm just making a guess. Here's a quick tip for linear regulators. The output capacitor should be smaller than the input capacitor. Linear regulators respond very fast to changes. So if there's this huge capacitor out on its output, the regulator could actually go into uh, short circuit shutdown trying to charge up that cap. Also, the output cap is really a filter capacitor, while the input capacitor is a decoupling capacitor, since it decouples the Arduino board from the power supply. But again, that's going to be another subject for yet another video. Since I am using this onboard regulator, I'm going to add a barrel jack as well as a header to bypass it. When I design the printed circuit board, I might end up deleting that header because it'll depend on how much space I have available. But since we're talking about header pins, what about I.O.? In a real design, you would probably have specific uses for the I.O. pins. In this case, I don't have a specific use and I don't want to just recreate an Arduino Nano. So I'm thinking about just putting a header pin, a group of header pins at the narrow end of the board. So let me put on a 10 pin header, which will give me enough for four analog and four digital signals which will also leave one pin for five volts and an additional pin for ground. When this blank 328 comes from the factory, it doesn't know how to do anything. It needs to be programmed either with your program or something like the Arduino bootloader so that you can, you know, program stuff over serial. If I was planning to use a dip style 328, I could actually program the chip before putting it into the PCB. However, since I want to use a surface mount part, I need a header to be able to program the initial bootloader. So in my design, I need to add one more pin header, and this one has the pins for an ICSP breakout already labeled. This just makes it easier to connect the signals on the 328 with node labels. In this design, I am not going to place a dedicated serial to USB chip. I am, however, going to add a header that allows common FTDI style boards to be easily plugged in. One benefit of this approach is that we don't need to add a TX or RX LED as well as a whole nother group of parts. All right, well, that's it. We have everything we need to make a functional board. Well, actually, wait, I forgot something. The most important thing, we need a power LED. So let's go add one of those real quick. I'm going to use a one kilo ohm resistor as the current limiter. This LED doesn't need to be all that bright, so a few milliamps is all we need to be able to see when there is power. All right, so now that's all we need to make our DIY Arduino. All of the electrical pieces are in place. In future videos, I'm gonna take you through the PCB layout as well as turn on, so stay subscribed to see when that happens. Check out the show notes at adohms.com EP23 for links to the schematic files. If you have any questions, leave them here or head over to discuss.addohms.com. When your circuit isn't working, remember, the best way to fix it is to just add ohms. I'm curious how many people see this message. So do me a favor and leave a comment but let's have some fun, not just any comment. Leave the name of a component, not like a part number, but like a component type, say like diode. 
Let's see how many people actually stick around to the end because this isn't the first time I've done this. 